Okay, welcome to our third lecture for cognitive science. This lecture is going to cover uh, modularity and the architecture of minds. So I want to start by talking about this concept of architecture that Karsten discusses in her article. And what I want to talk about first is um, what does it mean for a cognitive system to have an architecture? I mean, we often talk, you know, for about um, uh, buildings and things like this having an architecture. So we can talk about, uh, you know, my house having an architecture, main hall having an architecture. Um, but what does that mean really? Well, um, it seems that, you know, one thing we might mean by architecture is a complex or carefully designed structure of something, right? So I might talk about the architecture of a um, building, or I could also talk about like the architecture of a tree or a um, or an anthill or something like that. All of those things could be uh, complexly designed, maybe not carefully designed. We don't think of the ants as exercising care or of the um, genetic material of the tree as exercising, exercising care. But they are complexly designed and they have a kind of structure that we can describe in some way. And so a question that would naturally arise is, well, does the mind have an architecture? It doesn't seem like it's quite like those other things. Like when we talk about the mind, I mean, we certainly can talk about the architecture of the physical brain, but a mind seems in some ways quite different from a brain. We can imagine creatures that lack brains having minds. There could be someday minded robots or things like that. Um, and uh, indeed, like the relationship even between the mind and the body is not really well defined uh, where we are now in science. So it's, it's not going to be quite the same as having uh, the architecture of a brain, which is a physical structure. So what does it mean for the mind to have an architecture, right? Again, it's not a kind of physical architecture like the walls and rooms of my house or main hall um, or the neural, neural structure of the brain. So what is it? Well, what we mean when we talk about the mind as having an architecture is that the mind has a kind of relational structure, right? Um, so there are different components of our brains that relate to each other in distinct, distinctive ways. And those relations might be temporal in some way. Maybe some processing is done earlier in the mind than other processing. That would be a kind of relationship we could point to between those two kinds of processes. Or it may even be in some ways causal or uh, epistemically prior to. It could be that, for example, um, for vision, uh, maybe there are some processes that have to do their work first before other processes do their work in order for me to see the world around me. So what we talk about when we talk about architecture is that kind of relational structure of the mind. How do the processes of the mind relate to one another? Which processes serve as inputs for others and so on. So we're gonna be talking about that today. Um, and, and in fact, that is what cognitive science is attempting to describe for the human mind. <clears throat> so the article that you read for today draws a distinction between um, what we might think of as brute reflexes and uh, what we can describe as intelligent activities. So um, let's just think of two examples of this. So imagine, you are at the doctor and the doctor is um, uh, testing your uh, uh, patellar ligament reflex, right? So that's the little strip of muscle underneath your knee. Um, the doctor hits it with a hammer and your knee jerks forward as in this picture. We've all had this done. Um, well, in this case, um, what is going on? Well, this is a reflex. This is some, a reflex that's happening in your leg. And so how can we describe this reflex? Well, one thing we can say is that it is uh, a kind of non-computational activity. That is, it, it, it doesn't really need to be described as the transformation of information, right? There are some things that we sort of are forced to describe as involving the transfer of information. So like think about um, your deciding to open uh, your bedroom door, right? That clearly involves some kind of transfer of information from your brain to your arm, the muscles in your arm, which leads you to open the door. But we don't have to think of transfer of information here. It's more of kind of a brute response that we're getting. 
Um, and also there's something else we can describe uh, this, this um, reflex as, and that is as being encapsulated. So the idea is here that it can't respond to our relevant beliefs or wishes, right? If you do not want to jerk your leg up when the doctor hits it with the rubber hammer, you're still going to do it. You don't, you're not able not, you're not able to control it. You can't decide not to jerk your leg up. So this uh, palatal uh, or patellar reflex of kicking your leg up is both non-computational, doesn't involve anything like information, and it's also encapsulated. It can't respond to beliefs or desires that are outside of the system in our mind. We can't decide not to do it. Well, this is directly opposed to things that we might describe as intelligent activities. So let's think of an, an example of an intelligent activity now. So consider planning your next vacation. So here you are planning your next vacation. Well, first of all, we, we, we do think of this as a process of transformation of information. And what do I mean by this? Well, you might have certain initial assumptions you work for to derive the conclusion of what you actually want to do. Um, so maybe you're thinking, maybe you're fond of hiking, but um, you also know that um, you have young children who aren't going to be able to accompany you on a hike if you do that, right? Um, so putting these two ideas together, you reach the conclusion that, well, the hiking trip that you might prefer to go on is not really what you should, what you should choose to take your family on. Right, so you decide, you start thinking of something else. Maybe you start thinking of a beach trip, right? All of that is gonna be a kind of inferential process involving pre-existing assumptions and beliefs that lead us to a new conclusion. In other words, that is a paradigmatically uh, informational kind of activity that's going on here, uh, uh, completely different from the patellar reflex. Additionally, this is uh, an activity that is uh, non-encapsulated. It is a perfect example of that, right? Um, you know, uh, when I'm thinking of what I want to do, um, some other contrary considerations may come up that I hadn't been considering initially, and they may cause me to change my plans, right? Maybe I'm thinking of going on the beach vacation, but suddenly I recall that there is a hurricane headed for um, the, the Caribbean, and that was where I was planning to take the trip, right? So um, these other background beliefs, background desires can interfere in the process and make it totally change its outcome, okay? So um, intelligent activities are both computational and non-encapsulated. So they're kind of the opposite of reflexes. But one thing that people working in this literature of modularity, the modularity of mind recognized back in uh, you know, the 80s and 90s when this kind of research was getting started was that these kind of well-defined activities that we knew a lot about, reflexes and intelligent activities, uh, didn't really rule out other logical possibilities. And indeed, it seemed that there was a kind of third kind of activity of human beings that we could talk about. Um, and that is what we might describe as cognitive reflexes, what Robin Karsten describes as cognitive reflexes. So these are the key heroes of today's discussion. And um, these cog cognitive reflexes sort of split the difference between pure reflexes and uh, effortful thought. So these are computational. They can't be described as a transformation of information. In fact, we need to describe them in that way to really capture what they're doing. But, um, so, so they are like uh, intelligent, um, well, actually, let me see what it's called. They are like uh, intelligent activities. In that way, they are a transformation of information but they're also encapsulated like mere reflexes. They can't respond to all relevant background beliefs, wishes, and et cetera. In other words, there is this variety of computational activity. We could call it maybe intelligent activity, um, but a variety that is not, or, or that is encapsulated and can't respond to all relevant background. So that's kind of the initial assumption that starts a lot of this literature going. Again, it is to suggest that there are three levels of cognitive architecture. And so these levels um, would be transducers, which are effectively um, going to be uh, brute reflexes, um, input-output systems, uh, and these are the kind of cognitive reflexes that we're talking about, the kind of computational but encapsulated systems. Uh, we'll describe them later as modules. 
And then there is going to be something called uh, central systems, which on kind of the classic picture, which we're going to start out talking about today, are the kinds of system to rational processes, which we encountered from Kahneman last week. So, um, uh, right, so uh, we're going to call uh, these, sorry, let me go back. We're going to call the input output systems um, modules, right, as I mentioned. So they're, they're going to be what we describe in the first instance as modules. Um, they are modular subsystems of the mind. Um, and why are they called input output systems? Well, essentially it is their relationship to the central systems that um, makes them input output systems. So if the central systems are system two, if we think back to Kahneman, that's going to be described as the kind, the part of the mind that we think of as ourselves, right? It is really the central part. It's the effortful part, the part that requires attention and maybe is identified with rationality. So um, there's been this tendency to sort of identify that as the important, important part of the human mind, the thinking part, the self, right? And these other systems are going to be the input and the output to that thing, right? So they're going to mediate um, uh, the light that hits my, uh, they're, they're going to mediate the information coming from the transducers, uh, my eyeballs in this instance, if we're thinking about vision. We'll get to that in just a second. And uh, they're going to transform whatever information comes in from the optic nerve into uh, um, intentional information or information that's about something that central systems can use. Um, and then additionally, central systems, like if we decide to do something, again, if I decide to open uh, my bedroom door, um, then uh, the central system is going to uh, have an idea that is going to be uh, outputted to uh, the uh, muscles that are in my arm that, can, that lead me to open the door. So input output systems are described relative to the central system. They're inputting into it or outputting from it. All right, let's look at these three systems in more detail. So we're going to talk about transducers first. And so what do we mean by transducers here? Well, again, I think if we want to draw out our analogy between uh, reflexes, cognitive reflexes, and intelligent activity, we can see transducers as, as uh, sort of being equivalent to uh, reflexes in certain important respects. Um, in effect, what we're thinking of when we think of transducers, if we just want to point to a part of our body that we're talking about here, instead of like just thinking of this abstractly, the part of our bodies, um, the part of our bodies that serve as transducers, according to this kind of modularity picture, are our various sense organs. So that would be things like our eyes, our ears, the nerves, uh, in our body, right? All of those uh, sensory systems are going to be the transducers. And so what do these do? Well, in effect, what these systems do is they receive sense modality specific proximal stimuli from the environment. So what does that mean? Well, um, proximal just means the stimuli that are closest to us, right? Um, and sense modality specific just means that they are the proximal stimuli, the stimuli that are closest to us that, um, that are responded to by whatever sense organ we're talking about, right? So if we're thinking about the eye, then it would be distributions of light across the lens of my eye as I look somewhere that are the uh, sense modality specific proximal stimuli. Um, if we're thinking of hearing, then it's going to be the sound waves that are hitting my uh, temporal drum in my ear, right? Those are going to be the proximal stimuli that that sense modality responds to, right? And, and of course, you know, uh, we can think of impressions on the skin for nerves and so on. We can think of other kinds of proximal stimuli um, that a sense modality responds to. So in effect, what the, translate, uh, what the transducers do is they translate. So they translate these stimuli into information on which perceptual computation can be performed, right? So again, if we want to think back to that picture, the sense organs are equivalent to um, the reflexes. They're, they're giving information to um, the, uh, these, um, uh, the, these uh, cognitive reflexes. Um, uh, so uh, the input output systems, they're translating stimuli um, from the environment into a kind of information rich system 
that a um, that a uh, intelligent reflex, a computational reflex, can use. So right again, um, if we think about the eye, <coughs> um, you know, uh, there is uh, light hitting the um, the lens of the eye, uh, and it is uh, that that light right is um, a kind of brute stimulus, uh, stim uh, a kind of uh, a brute stimuli that hits the eye, right? Um, Right, we know that um, light is not, uh, you know, our minds do not function, do not use light um, in their processes. There's not light working in there. Um, there's gonna be nerve signals that, are, that um, explain the functioning of our brain. Um, so in some way, this light that is hitting the, the lens of the eye has to be translated into uh, those nerve signals, uh, which are going to be um, actually eventually translated into the firing of neurons in the brain. I mean, that is essentially neurons are themselves uh, nerves, so this is going to be the, the um, use of a nerve signal in the brain. So what we need to do is we need to translate uh, the stimuli, the light that is hitting the eye, into something that the brain can work with. Um, so, yeah, so what happens uh, in these transducers is that these brute stimuli hit, uh, you, you know, uh, hit this part of the body and that brute stimuli is um, translated into something the brain can use. There's some sort of informative output that comes out of the optic nerve here that represents the distribution of light on the lens of the eye, but um, is itself encoded in a different kind of uh, signal that the brain itself can use. Okay, so the information from the external environment has been transduced at this point. Um, the thought next is that, that, uh, that um, Carson and others working in this modularity li literature putting forward is that um, upstream from these transducers, so we're just working in from the external to the internal, from the outside of the human into the human, upstream from these transducers are input uh, systems and they're output systems when we consider the other direction, right? So they're perceptual input systems and then, these say, and then underlying systems like this also serve as motor output systems, right? So the brain's impulses get uh, changed into actions which themselves proceed back out into the environment, okay? So, Let's consider these, we're going to primarily think of these from the point of view of perceptual input, right? So what we've previously looked at is light hitting the retina that gets transformed into a nerve signal that represents the distribution of light on the retina in that moment, okay? Um, that then is passed upstream to these input-output systems. And again, these are what we are thinking of as, um, as cognitive reflexes. They are in some way computational. They involve something we must describe using the concept of information exchange, but they are dumb systems that are not responsive to background beliefs. Um, so these input systems receive the transduced information about the proximal, proximal stimuli, again, electrical impulses that represent the distribution of light on the retina. And then they transform this limited information into representations of the distal stimuli that occupy the world, okay? So what do I mean by that, right? So what does your eye have as information about the world around it? What it has is just a distribution of light on a two-dimensional surface, the lens of your eye. Um, the transducers, all they send up is information about you know, like the optic nerve, is information about that distribution of light on that lens, okay? And that is information about a two-dimensional object, light spread across a pane, a lens, right? Um, but upstream of that optic nerve is, um, are the various input systems of vision which take that proximal stimuli and transform it using some proprietary, perhaps unknown to us, 
um, uh, algorithms, they transform that information uh, into a representation of a three-dimensional world that is around you. In other words, after these input systems have done their work, you have a uh, perceptual uh, experience of the world around you, um, a three-dimensional world with distance and speed and all of these other attributes that are not represented in a distribution of light on a two-dimensional surface, um, your, the lens of your eye. So obviously there has to be a lot of information transformation going on here. We have to work from this very uh, um, impoverished representation to get this very rich representation of the world around us. So the, the, the representations of distal stimuli are then like the representation of the external world around you, that three-dimensional representation is then the input to the central system. So you as a person um, understand that there is a tree in front of you or there's a dog in front of you, right? Um, and that is because that is the output from the subsystems of vision. And, and then the idea is just to flip this on its head, that output stimuli work in the opposite way. So they translate high level representational states like the desire to open your door into motor outputs, which affect external behavior, okay? All right, so then there's this other question about what are the central systems? Um, and, and, and we can describe them as working in, in this process as receiving information from all the perceptual input systems as integrating this with existing information, background desires, background uh, knowledge, and so on, um, and then deliberating to form new beliefs, to plan intelligent actions, and to make decisions. Um, this is how they have been described in any way. And then we typically think of central systems as executing these plans by interfacing with output systems, which transform conscious beliefs and desires into motion patterns that achieve the desired goal, okay? These are how uh, central systems are described in, uh, in um, Karsten. So, um, but now, and uh, the person that keeps popping into my head when I think Karsten is Kahneman. So now we're gonna look at Kahneman a little bit. So we know from Kahneman that there's gonna be this division between uh, system one and system two, right? System one, again, and, and we're going to think about this as a, a set of processes that um, occur in your brain. These system one processes are uh, quick. Um, they uh, um, are uh, uh, mandatory. They give their responses automatically. Um, I mean, you can't but uh, have that response happen if uh, you have the appropriate stimuli in the environment. Um, they are uh, um, shallow, they're kind of dumb, they give like simple responses. And certainly they're not, they don't, these system one processes are not affected by background beliefs, right? If we think about the Mueller liar uh, example, it shows this. You, if you believe, even if you believe that those lines are the same length, you can't help but see uh, the line with the inward facing arrow points as longer, right? Um, so, so, uh, that's what system one is like. And what does that sound like? Well, what it sounds like is, um, is uh, system one sounds like um, these input systems, right? If we're going to map this on to our three-level model that we've just been discussing, then input systems are going to correspond to system one, whereas um, the central systems, which are more rational, more deliberative, what we identify as ourselves, are clearly going to respond to system two. So you can see now that this kind of modularity view we've been talking about really lines up well with what we were talking about last week about um, system one and system two. And indeed, this is uh, part of the whole picture that Kahneman has in mind here. All right. Another way to think of the system that we've just described is in terms of a visual model. Now, obviously, this is not a visual model of some actual physical space. You know, we might have like a, a model of the brain that showed us where the different uh, sulci and like the different parts of the brain are and everything. But, but the mind is a non-physical thing. It's like a functional entity. So we, this isn't a model of 
any physical space, but this is a kind of relational model that may help you understand how the mind works. I'm going to ask that you uh, think about uh, the, what this picture means and trying to understand what this vision of modularity is. So the way I want you to think about this is if, if we're in the center, that is sort of the most high level, the most processed um, uh, cognitive piece here, okay? Um, that, you know, if you want to think of the system one and system two uh, stuff, that is the thing that is like most you in some way, right? So it's, it's like that central processing is the rational part you think of yourself. In any way, it's the most um, sort of built up component of thought, okay? Um, outside of this circle is the external world, okay? Everything that's not you, as we're going to describe it at this point. Um, so how is this model working? Well, outside of you is all the physical world that's around you. And that whole physical world is impinging on your body all the time. There's light hitting your uh, eyes. Uh, there's, there's sound waves batting against your ears. Um, you're feeling things on the surface of your skin and so on. So all of that external world is hitting you. And, and what it's hitting is your sense organs. And they are transducing those brute stimuli from the world around you into a kind of information that your mind can use. Um, so that uh, information then is passed on to the modular input systems or system one of the mind. And so these modular input systems are going to be hierarchically arranged, right? Um, so in effect, I have put here um, a kind of triangle to show you that this might be something we could describe as the vision module. I really don't want you to kind of use that language because it's a little weird to think of vision itself as a single module. Really what vision consists of is a variety of different modules that serve to produce a visual impression of the world around us. But there is in some way this kind of complex system that we can describe as vision. And inside of that system are these kind of hierarchically arranged um, simple processes, okay? They um, each are responsive to their own, to their own specific kind of information. Um, they perform their own distinctive kinds of jobs to transform that information. And what they give out is, is a very kind of shallow output. It's not changed that much from what they got. But the idea is that these things are hierarchically arranged in such a way that they can pass information upstream to create this very rich representation of the world around us. So the modular subsystems of vision are um, working together to pass information one to the other after very simple transformations to produce a, a vision of the world or, or, or a visual perception of the world. So if we want to think of like giving some names to some of these modules of vision, we can describe A in this model as perhaps being an edge detector. So if you think about the transducers as giving us information about the distribution of light across the retina, then um, this system A may identify where the shapes or, or where the edges of the items uh, on the retina are. So it can detect through light gradations that this is an edge right here, right? You know, just like objects in our surface have edges, um, you know, like a desk has an edge. It seems like vision very on, early on, first process is like where the edges of objects are. That information may get cast, passed along to um, system B, which does a further transformation on the uh, stream of information. It says, okay, system A, you identified the edges. I'm going to identify now the shapes. It looks like there's this horizontal out here, this horizontal shape here, and then the circular shape here, whatever. And it passes that kind of information on about the shape of objects in the environment to system C. And now system C maybe is a kind of object identifying system. And so it, you know, clumps these different shapes together to construct a kind of object, maybe an object of a desk or a dog or something that's in your environment. Right. And so that eventually then also enters this kind of uh, perception of the external world. Right? So the idea is that each of these little systems, by doing these very small processes, can build up on one another to produce this very rich representation of the world around us. And then that representation itself is passed on 
to uh, central systems. In other words, um, I as a conscious being can reflect on things in my environment. So I can think, um, oh, uh, that dog actually has only three legs. That may be a surprising thing and something that I consciously notice in some way. And maybe I direct my attention to where the dog's uh, leg was amputated based upon that and understand something more about uh, the visual world that I'm apprehending around me, right? Um, but that's all because I have this visual perception of the world available to me that's supplied through these kind of uh, simple input systems of system one. Okay, so that's kind of the picture that we're dealing with here. So let's talk about some of the characteristics of these simple modules that we've described. Essentially, there are eight of them that people have identified. And if we go back to kind of Karsten, who is um, writing fairly early on in this literature, not um, one of the earliest writers on it, that would be Jerry Fodor, who is a very important early figure on here, we'll talk about in a second. And of course, that Karsten herself talks about uh, quite a bit. Um, there are going to be eight features that they identify, although three are kind of the primary ones that people have identified with modules uh, moving forward. Obviously, in the intervening years, there's been a lot of debate over the structure of these things. So <clears throat> one thing that's thought about these modules is that they are domain specific. So what that means is that there is a particular domain of stimuli that they respond to, a specific domain of stimuli that turns them on. When those things are present, this, any module is gonna be doing its work. Of course, that domain is gonna vary from module to module, but the idea is for each module, there's some sort of things that turn it on, make it do, do its work, and uh, so on. They're also going to be informationally encapsulated. That's one of the key features we've described before. So what does it mean for them to be informationally encapsulated? Well, what that means is that um, there's uh, that they're, they're not going to be subject to change from any other information. Okay, so a certain kind of a certain uh, set of uh, uh, features turn them on and then other features are just completely irrelevant. They don't care about any other information in the system. So that's not going to be coming in in any way. Okay. Um, and then the third key feature here is that they are mandatory. And so the idea for mandatoriness is just going to be that um, you can't sort of choose whether or not these things do their work, right? I can be thinking for a little while about uh, planning my family's next vacation and then think, oh, actually, I need to get to work on this lecture I've got to record, so I'm going to uh, not do that right now. That's under my control, like that central process is. But as I've mentioned in class, if I see uh, a word in my native language, it's not under my control to read that thing. If I see a dog in my environment, I can't just decide that that dog isn't there. My system, my visual system is going to report that dog is there. So these things are mandatory uh, in a way that central processes are not, okay? Um, and then there are certain other features that are pointed to here. Uh, another really crucial one is that these systems are speedy. In a certain sense, that's kind of what their benefit is. They do their work quickly, and that's why they've evolved. That's why they're useful. Um, they also give us kind of relatively shallow outputs, right? So um, this sort of explains the speediness. The fact is that these um, modules, um, they're so fast, because they're so fast, they, um, or the reason that they're so fast is that they're just doing these very simple transformations. This module is just identifying where the edges are, and that's it. This one is simply saying where the shapes are based upon where the edges are, and that's it. This one is simply saying what the surfaces are, whatever, right? So from each one, there's a very small transformation. That is actually partially what explains its speediness together with the mandatoriness. Um, and then some other features, uh, people have traditionally or in, in the early days thought that these uh, modules had a kind of standard ontogenetic development. So what does that mean? Well, the thought was originally that like these modular subsystems develop at the same time for everyone. And that certainly does seem to be true of some of these, right? Like the visual system, if children are placed in the appropriate environment, will develop in a kind of standard way. But we know now that that is not the case for all um, 
for all of these modules. We know, and we'll talk about this more in just a minute, but that's the idea. Ontogeny is just the development of the child across their, um, across their lifetime or the, uh, the development of the organism across its lifetime. And it was thought that these things develop at a standard time, but um, that's come more and more into debate. Um, another is that these are subject kind of characteristic breakdowns. So the thought here is, um, if this is a, a specific system that does a specific job, then we should see it break down in the same way across different people. And if we think that this, if this particular module is hierarchically arranged above others, then it should affect anything that's downstream from it. But also if it breaks down, um, it shouldn't be a devastating breakdown for the system as a whole because it's kind of a small part that, you know, even though it can affect other things if it's upstream from them, it's not as though it's like a kind of general purpose reasoning module, um, uh, or it's not like a general purpose uh, um, uh, thought that could break down in very catastrophic ways, right? Um, and then the last point is just that uh, originally these were thought to be neurally, uh, neural specified as well. So that means that they would always recur in basically the same part of the brain. I think again, there's some debate about this now, and that sort of goes with the idea of uh, the worry about standard ontogenetic development. So I'm going to focus in on domain specificity, informational encapsulation, and mandatoriness. And then after I conclude those three, that'll uh, finish this part of the lecture, and I'll talk about some other components of these in another late lecture later on. Okay, so let's look at these big three. Okay, domain specificity. Well, here's how Fodor puts it. Um, domain specificity has to do with the range of questions for which a device provides answers, the range of inputs for which it computes analyses, okay? Um, so uh, another way, or I mean, I think this is the same way to think of this, um, uh, is what are the stimuli that turns this thing on? Um, what are the proximal stimuli the things in the brain that make this system do its work, okay? And, um, you know, typically we can think of vision as breaking down into all of these different systems. It seems that there is a system that has the specific job of detecting faces and also of recognizing the faces we've seen before in the past. People can lose this capacity. Um, when they do, they have a condition called face blindness and, and in severe cases can't even recognize their closest loved ones like their spouse. Um, but if we think about the system, what is it responsive to? Um, what, answer, what questions does it provide answers to? Well, it provides answers to the question of whose face is that and the data it is responsive to is data about faces, okay? So faces are what is going to turn this thing on. Right, there are going to be processes downstream of this that identify the shapes of this thing. And then once it's, it's in some way um, detected that it is um, of the appropriate kind, this module will be turned on. Okay? Um, now, uh, these domains are typically more fine-grained than sensory modalities like vision and audition. Right? It's not just going to be uh, visual stimuli that turn it on. It's not just going to be like herd stimuli that turn it on. It's going to be a particular kind of stimuli. But I sort of lied when I said that the face module is going to be responsive to faces. I mean, as a matter of fact, the things in the world that turn it on are faces, but we may not actually know what it is responding to, right? When the face module is acting appropriately, it is turned on by faces. But what turns it on can't be faces because it's its job, I mean, can't be faces per se, because it's its job to detect them, right? Um, so what has to turn it on is some domain of stimuli that we can't exactly describe. And we know it's not just faces because things that aren't faces turn on this domain. I mean, turn, turn on this module, right? So if we look here on the left, this thing appears to us as a face. It was designed to appear to us as a face. Um, what is that? That's a car grill. But if we look at the one on the right, we don't get the same impression of that thing as a face. So it's not only the faces that we saw previously that turn on the face module, 
that lead this module to say there's a face, right? It's, it's in some way things that have some sort of visual property that we maybe can't describe um, from our own subjective point of view. It would be up to vision scientists to investigate what exactly is the distribution of stuff that is turning on this face module, right? Um, so in some way, it's a distribution of seen objects or shapes in the environment, but, but we don't know exactly what that is intuitively. We would have to figure it out through experimentation. It would be up to psychologists to figure that thing out. And they have made some headway on these questions. All right, so that's what I'm gonna say about domain specificity. There's in some way some fine-grained domain that makes the thing do its work, that makes the face module say there were faces there, right? Um, additionally, these modules are going to be informationally encapsulated. Um, and now sometimes information encapsulation is characterized as two features. So encapsulation proper is thought of involving restriction on the flow of information into a mechanism. Okay, so certain kinds of information can't come into the mechanism. And also it's thought to involve restriction on the flow of information out of it. So an example of each of these two things. Um, well, here's the classic illustration of encapsulation, right? Um, the system doesn't allow information, background information to flow into, um, inform into the module, okay? And the classic example of that is just the Mueller liar illusion, right? So as we mentioned last time, um, as we mentioned last time, you may know the line that now appears on the top is the exact same size as the line that appears on the bottom. You may have measured them. That belief may be firm in your system, in, you, in, your, in your system of beliefs, which are, um, you know, we might think of as being stored within system two. That's probably a bad way to think of it, but we'll say that now. You know that belief. You, I mean, you know that to be true. You have that belief, but that doesn't affect how you see this thing. The vision module or whatever vision module is responsible for telling you that this that this top line is longer, doesn't care about that background information. It just cares about what's coming in from uh, below, and it just gives the same output regardless, because it's not looking at this kind of background stuff that's uh, higher upstream within thought from it, okay? So that's a classic illustration of uh, encapsulation, the way in which a module um, restricts the flow of information into the mechanism. What about uh, inaccessibility? Um, well, uh, <clears throat> there are a variety of different uh, examples of this. One of them is uh, this idea of comprehension of what is said. So we don't typically notice the specific differences in the auditory stimulus that the system used to identify a word. In other words, our language modules can understand what a word is but it's very difficult for us to tell like what the sound wave shape of a word is. That's actually something that um, uh, engineers have had a lot of trouble doing is identifying what the shape of a word is, what the sound shape of a word is, because it varies so much from speaker to speaker. Another example of inaccessibility might be what we just talked about previously. What is the um, what is it that the face module is responding to, right? Um, what is the information it takes as input? Well, we don't exactly know that, right? We just know the things that we end up thinking of as faces, but we don't really know what, um, what turns that module on and what it's using in its own internal processes, because we can't look in there to see what the information inside of there is. Okay, I'm going to end on mandatoriness. So what is mandatoriness? Well, I think this one is sort of the most straightforward. We can say that modules are fast, cheap, and out of control. Um, uh, again, this is uh, something said by the robot designer um, uh, Brooks at MIT. Um, it's also the name of a movie um, by the director uh, Errol Morris that I mentioned to some of you in class earlier. But this is, this is a kind of defining feature of modules. They are fast, cheap, and out of control. And mandatoriness is sort of their out of controlness. What is mandatoriness? It is automaticity. 
a module does its work automatically. We don't have to think about it. We don't have to concentrate to turn it on. If the stimuli is present, it does its work and it in fact has to do its work. Example, when this word popped up, dog, you read it immediately as dog, right? You can't but read a word in your native language or a language you know as um, meaning what it means, right? That part of your language processing system is modular. The part that identifies the, um, the semantics of a word, the meaning of a word. And if it's presented with the appropriate uh, formal property, it will do its work. It will, it will read it as um, what it means. Mandatoriness is also demonstrated in garden path sentences. So consider this sentence. The horse ran round the barn collapsed. Or another example, the old man the boat right? These sentences are broadly grammatical, especially the second, the old man, the boat, right? Um, but uh, we know that, um, but it still throws us off when we read that thing. And the reason it throws us off is um, we read the old as a noun phrase, and then that forces us to read man as a verb phrase. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, I'm sorry, that forces us to read, I'm sorry, we read uh, the old man is a noun phrase. And then we read another noun phrase immediately after that, the boat. Um, well, we know in English, English has a uh, subject verb structure. So you can't have subject subject that's non-grammatical and that throws us off. And, and that leads us to go back and reinterpret this. But why do we have to reinterpret it in the first place? Well, the reason is our language processing system or our, our system that's responsible for understanding the syntactic structure of a sentence is uh, predictive, okay? So if it's presented with a noun phrase and it's been trained up on English, then being presented with that noun phrase, it will mandatorily assign a syntactic structure to that whole sentence. It's gonna say, okay, this was the noun phrase, so verb is coming next. But then when that is frustrated, by the next words, it has to go back and reassess and reinterpret and uh, prospectively go back and fix that mistake it has made. But the point here is, um, presented with a noun phrase, that system mandatorily assigns a syntactic structure to the whole sentence, right? Um, it's that quick, it does its work even before the stimuli that would determine what the actual structure of the sentence is have been given. Another example, the stupid people say it hurts my brain. I kind of like that one. Mary gave the child the dog uh, bit a Band-Aid. Mary gave the child the dog bit a Band-Aid. Get it? Mary gave the child the dog bit. Um, and the prime number few. Okay, those are examples there. Well, next time, I'm gonna stop here. Uh, and next time I'm going to go into this stuff about modular systems as they relate to vision and language, and we're going to consider why modular systems exist and what's some of their background. But look for that in the next lecture, which should be coming down the pike tomorrow. I hope you all have a nice weekend, and I will see you soon.